So, hello everyone, welcome. We'll just wait another minute or so as people need to filter in a little more. So, hello everyone, welcome to Imagine Our Futures. This is the final session in the series Food, Farming and Healing Our World. My name is Ruby and I'm a co-founder of the transformative education platform Advaya. Over the last four weeks, we've been collaborating with Chance Green Publishing and many of their amazing authors to explore how to transform the ways we farm and how we think about the food we eat. We've been looking at how food and farming relate to the health of planetary ecologies and ecosystems, our economies and communities, and our relationship as a whole. In this final gathering, Imagining Our Futures, we're exploring why cultural narratives and imagination are so important to the future of food and farming, our communities and our world. We're joined by another brilliant panel, writer, localizationist, founder of Transition Towns, Totnes, storyteller, brewer, podcaster, and more, Rob Hopkins, whose book is What Is to What If? Unleashing the Power of Imagination to Create the Future We Want. We're also joined by Welsh Government Minister, University Pro Vice Chancellor, land restorer, author, smallholder, and environmental act uh, activist, Jane Davidson, who wrote Future Gen, Lessons from a Small Country, and Gillian Burke, biologist, presenter, public speaker, voiceover artist, writer, and mother, who's been presenting Spring Watch and many other nature programs on the BBC since 2016. Tonight, we're going to talk about why imagination and cultural narratives are so important when it comes to responding to challenges and creating the world we know as possible. Often it can seem as though we've entered into a sort of dystopian trance and there's many good reasons for it. And there's a lot of bad news in the world. The problem is when we ask a lot of young people in particular, our images of what the far future looks like, the pictures we often describe are things like Blade Runner or Mad Max. It's kind of dystopian apocalyptic view of the future where humanity is a virus. Martin Luther King said that any movement or culture that can't paint a portrait of, the, of where it wants to go will fail as you have neither hope or direction. And we could say that the great work of today is to imagine and cultivate the futures of our dreams to get to the point where we wake up every morning excited, wanting to make our vision happen. Even if it's just so that we end up, don't end up in the dystopian vision that we see. Um, and Rob, in your book, you speak a lot about this idea about how we must reimagine and rebuild and the role of imagination and storytelling in cultivating what you call longing. Um, I'd love for you to start us off and to tell us a little bit about why you think it's so important and how imagination even has anything at all to do with the way we farm and the food we eat. So I'll pass to you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Lovely to see so many of you here. Um, yeah, I the way I like to to kind of ease in to thinking about imagination is by uh, kind of telling a little story, I guess, about where we are in history. You know, I, I, I like to think of the way of where we are in 2021 in the world as being like standing on top of a mountain. And the mountain that we stand on top of is a mountain of more debt, more inequality, more plastic, more anxiety, uh, more loneliness than we've ever stood on top of before, more carbon. And the guides who are at our side who know this mountain really well are saying, we need to get down off this mountain really, really quickly. Look, you can see the storm clouds that are coming. We need to get down off this mountain really quite fast. And for a lot of us, that for a lot of people, that's okay. They're the, guy, they're the experts. They know this mountain. They're the guides. Let's go. Let's take their word for it. But for a lot of people, that doesn't seem to be working. And I wonder whether whether rather than trying to <clears throat> win everybody over with facts and figures and policy arguments, 
actually, this is much more about imagination and storytelling, because maybe a better strategy is to tell stories of the valleys that await us at the bottom of this mountain, of the warm welcome that awaits us there, the, the warm bed, the fireside, the fantastic food, the delicious wine, the dry socks that await us once we actually make our way down off this mountain. And then the task becomes not one of trying to convince everybody with facts and figures, it becomes about the cultivation of longing. How do we cultivate a longing for a different world and that's that's a very different thing than trying to convince uh, everybody that we're right i think and uh one example of that i think is is when we went to the moon when neil armstrong went to the moon in 1969 it wasn't his idea it wasn't jfk's idea in 1960 we had been going to the moon before then for decades and decades tintin went to the moon frank sinatra sang us to the moon Mickey Mouse probably went to the moon for all I know. Everybody had gone to the moon. By the, by the time Neil Armstrong went there, we'd been there hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times in stories and created such a, an intense collective longing to do that, that it took nine years from scratch. And the average age of the team that got us there was 26. So for me, it, it, there's something about cultivating, working on the imagination that feels like a fundamental uh, missing piece in all of this. And, um, and there was a quote that I wanted to tell you. So uh, Walida Im Imarisha, who's an amazing writer about the power of, uh, of storytelling, she said, whenever we try to envision a world without war, without violence, without prisons, without capitalism, we are engaging in speculative fiction, all organizing, is science fiction. I think that's so brilliant. I'm going to say it again. All organizing is science fiction. Once the imagination is unshackled, liberation is limitless. And uh, I, one of the things that, that, that I learned when I was researching from what is to what if, I spent about two years interviewing everybody I could find who knew anything about this, and was, was this idea that um, the more limits we put when we put limits around the imagination we're able to be so much more imaginative so uh i always like to talk about the dr seuss's book green eggs and ham yeah which i'm sure most of you know you can recite great chunks of with your eyes closed that book came about because dr seuss was challenged by his publisher to write a book that just used uh 50 words and it took him two years he always said it was one of the most stimulating things that he ever did uh when you put limits around the imagination you get this kind of uh uh, I, I, I don't fly, so I, I get to go and visit transition groups all across Europe, from the north of Sweden to Mallorca, across to like Austria and stuff. I visit many, many places where the transition movement is active, and they're working within those limits. They're saying, okay, we recognize climate change, resource depletion, we need to change what we're doing, and I see this incredible flowering of imagination and possibility. It's like when I visit breweries who try to use the maximum amount of local ingredients they can and create incredible beers that Heineken couldn't dream of in a million years. You know, when you put those limits, uh, you see this incredible flourishing. And I worry that actually we're living in a time where our imagination, which should be a muscle like this, is actually much more like this, because we have created this perfect storm of conditions for our imagination to shrink. There was research published in 2010 by a woman called Kyung Hee Kim, a researcher in America, who concluded that IQ and imagination rose together till sometime in the mid 90s, and then IQ kept rising and imagination started to go into what she called a steady and persistent decline and has been declining ever since. And I feel like a lot of what we're seeing in the world today is the result of that. She said that was due to the decline of play, the loss of this sort of culture of our children growing up surrounded by other children playing and, and having that whole world that children can create, that we spend less and less time in nature, uh, that we see we know that anxiety and stress and trauma make the part of our brain where our imagination fires from shrink. So in some ways, imagination is a function of privilege. We need to be looking at something like austerity as being a direct assault on the collective imagination. Things like a universal basic income of four day working week should be reframed as a national imagination strategy. And uh, so one of the things I like to do is to work with people to try and kind of cultivate and nurture uh, 
help them to imagine what that future could be like. What would it, and we're going to do a bit of it later on. And it's something I do uh, in every episode of the podcast series that I do from what if to what next is to ask the guests to close their eyes, imagine due to my time machine that they can't see because we're on Zoom that I've been building in my garage during lockdown from some plans I found online and some bits I had lying around. We're going to travel forward to 2030. That is the result of us having done everything we could possibly do. It's not utopia, but it's, it's, it's a remarkably transformative formed because all the things we work for in our movements uh, have happened. T tell us about it, walk us through it. And for many people, it's a really, really moving experience actually to do that. I like to think of it as creating memories of the future. Or well, the poet Rilke once said, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens, which again is so beautiful, I'm gonna say it again. The future must enter into you a long time before it happens. And so in the transition movement, I see many examples of places where people are using this idea of what if, what if questions to unlock stuff. And seeing as we're talking about food and farming, I'm just gonna wrap up my little, my contribution to this section with a little story that, 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 that's in the book, and which is also a story which for me is one of the most beautiful examples of what if in the transition movement. So uh, in Liège in Belgium, a few years ago, about six years ago, the transition group there, Liège en Transition, came up with a what if question. They said, what if in a generation's time, the majority of food eaten in the city came from the land closest to the city? Such a beautiful question, because one of the things about a good what if question is, uh, as Antanas Mokus, who used to be the mayor of Bogota, who's quite a big character in the book, he had the good if question really well. He said, what people love most is when you write on the blackboard a risky first half of a sentence and then recognize their freedom to write the other half. I think of a good what if question as being like in Alice in Wonderland where she's too big to go through the little door into the garden, she can look through and she can see it. So that question unlocked this incredible movement around it, it's called Centure Alimentaire, means food belt. I went, I came home, I went back four years later. In Liège, they had then created 25 new cooperatives. They'd raised 5 million euros of investment from local people. They had four shops in the center of the city, a local currency. They're working with all of the anchor institutions in the city to reimagine food and farming uh, in, the, in, in the city. It's phenomenal. I met the mayor who said, we used to say we want to be a smart city. Now we want to be a transition city. But it comes back to that, that it being have, having a really great what if question. And when I asked Christian, who was one of the organizers, how did you do all of this? He said, we had a great narrative. We had a really great story and a story that people could hear and they could see themselves in it. And it opened up new possibilities uh, of what they thought was possible. So um, I could go on and on and on. I think I've had my 10 minutes and, uh, and I'm also much more curious to hear from the other speakers. So at, at that point, I will hand on and I will see you all again shortly. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, really love how you ended the story there about having a great narrative and a great story that people can see themselves in, because it's that sense of identification and connection um, that can really inspire change, I think. Um, and, and Jane, I'd love to, um, to speak a little bit with you about your book, um, because especially, Rob was just talking talking about how um, a lot of the decline in imagination stemmed from childhood um, with this decline in play and community and time in nature, which was then creating a lot of the problems and the things, challenges that we're facing now. And what's so inspiring about your book and your work in Welsh government in general is the long-term thinking that you've, you've brought to policy, um, which is a far cry of so much politics where elections are often dictated by a term of four or five years rather than generations um, and I'd love you us I'd love you to tell us a little bit about the well-being of future generations act um, why it's so special and especially the thinking that got you to that point thank you Ruby thank you so much and um, I'm, I'm I'm delighted to join you on the call today and I'm I'm absolutely delighted there are people from all over the world here um, and, and Rob it's it, it's always a pleasure to listen to you because you always just set me off <laughs> when you're talking about what if. And I realized that actually, I've been asking that question, what if, my whole life. 
Uh, and I think we should be asking what if. So I probably was a really, really annoying child because I was that person who always said, well, why do we have to do it that way? What if we did it this way? What if we thought differently about this? And, and I think in some senses, it's a, it's a very good frame of mind for people who go into politics or policy making. So that it's not a frame of mind which is about um, thinking cumulatively. It's not a frame of mind that says that you will, you know, change a little bit, but actually, why do we accept what we have now? Because we've not been the agents of what we have now. We may not like what we have now. There's an awful lot of what's around now in policy and politics and law that I dislike hugely. But how did we get here and why didn't we challenge it? And I think that the that, that is kind of like the, the background narrative um, the little story, well, a big story, I hope, depending on what people think about it, of a little country. Um, that country is Wales. Um, we're uh, only 5% of the population of the United Kingdom. Uh, we have some 3 million people, 10 million sheep. We were probably the birth of the Industrial Revolution. I think we can claim that, but not in a positive way, in the sense that the money that Wales put into the Industrial Revolution, i.e. the coal, the iron, the steel, all the things that fueled the Industrial Revolution, that money didn't go to Wales, that went elsewhere. And although the first million pound check anywhere in the world was signed in the Welsh Coal Exchange, actually the history of Wales is that everything that was extracted, whether it be resources or money, went elsewhere. And Wales today is still the poorest part of the United Kingdom. And I, I just love Wales. I mean, Wales is, a, I, I came here in my teens um, and Wales is just this incredible place in terms of community. I mean, I know friends who live in London or other big cities where they don't know their next door neighbors. If you don't know your whole street here, <laughs> you're a failure <laughs> because people really know their communities and communities are really strong. And in the context of COVID, um, you know, when if we put a call out to say you need help, there are dozens of people who want to help you. And that's the sort of nature of the country. There's something about bonding and there's something about that industrial heritage. And there's also something about the fact that most of Wales is rural. Um, and that means at the moment that Wales is a country which is contributing massively to climate change, both on the fossil fuel front in industry, but also because of the way farming has operated in terms of actually giving farmers reasonable incomes from their land. So I'm in a tiny little organic haven. Uh, we have 10 acres surrounded by pesticide driven um, farming. Um, we have sheep and cattle all around us most times of the year. Uh, they're indoors at the moment or lamb, uh, for lambing and the, bee, the cattle were indoors during the winter. Um, but those, these fields are never given a chance to do anything other than grow on the pesticides. So the soil is depleted every year. And the Climate Change Commission has said that Wales will be the last in the UK to actually achieve the agricultural change necessary. And that for me is not good enough. It's not good enough that we're talking about not achieving changes which we need now by 2050. And I think that the, that's my fundamental thought process in why we have a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in Wales. And I spent years doing jobs in the working as a teacher, working as a youth worker, working as a policymaker. Um, uh, outside local government and then inside local government. And then this fantastic opportunity came up where I became one of the first um, assembly members for the new National Assembly for Wales in 1999. And all my life up until that point, you know, I was strongly supportive of young people. I always wanted to give them a voice. I was uh, very strong in terms of being an environmentalist. Um, and when I, that's what I brought in to this new political system. And I was incredibly excited to find that when the new political system was set up in Wales, Wales not only um, was creating a new political proposition for its people, but it had put into 
uh, the founding constitution a duty to promote sustainable development in everything the new National Assembly did. And although this was at the same time that Scotland had its parliament and Northern Ireland had its assembly, only Wales was given that duty. That was tremendously exciting. And I kind of felt that I'd come home because I wanted to policy make for young people and spent seven years as Minister for Education. And I wanted to policy make for the environment. And during my education time, I did lots of things uh, to ensure that our curriculum meant that children had to how, were outdoors for part of it. And my best headline in the whole of my life as a minister was Minister Makes Children Play in the Rain. And I dare you to beat that one <laughs> in the context of looking at just changing systems. But the real opportunity was not that duty to promote sustainable development, because actually in the first 10 years of the assembly, when I was a minister there, it was actually really hard. What does promote look like? What does sustainable development mean? And even when you start defining, like we use the Brundtland definition for sustainable development, what it didn't do was break it down in a way the civil service could get their head around or people in the public services in Wales for whom the assembly was responsible. So when I was given the ministerial responsibility, I thought we've got to make this the central organizing principle of government. We've got to make it so nothing can be done without reference to this. And we devised a scheme called One Wales, One Planet and I thought things were going really, really well, and then found that a year after we had the political agreement for that, the head of the civil service was said everything was going swimmingly, but we couldn't see any change. And therefore I realized that actually, if we were gonna make this change happen, it couldn't be a policy. And it couldn't be a policy based around an idea. It had to be much tighter than that. And therefore I proposed a law, a law that would ensure that all public services in Wales, including the government, had to deliver on sustainable development. And instead of sustainable development just being a general proposition, now it's clear. It was seven goals. A, pros a prosperous Wales, a resilient Wales, a healthier Wales, a more equal Wales, a Wales of cohesive communities, a Wales of vibrant culture and thriving Welsh language, a globally responsible Wales. But the amazing thing about these goals, not only that they fit with the sustainable development goals, but a prosperous Wales is defined in law as an innovative, productive and low carbon society, which recognizes the limits of the global environment. Also that goes on to act on climate change and create opportunities for wealth generation through securing decent work. Now, I'm not gonna read out all these goals for you because I will, um, when we move on a little uh, in a moment to Gillian, I'll put the link to this um, in the chat. But the important thing about it, a resilient Wales, not just maintaining, but enhancing its biodiverse natural environment, a healthier Wales, maximizing people's physical and mental well-being. So not reactive, but active turning the whole thing on its head and saying only this behaviour will work in Wales. And to make sure that people were clear about how it should be delivered, also in the law, are five ways of working. People have to think long term, they have to think preventatively, they have to integrate their thinking around those goals, they have to collaborate with each other to achieve this, and they have to involve people about whom decisions are being made. And interestingly, I said a moment ago, these linked with the sustainable development goals. Interestingly, I was shocked to find that when I was writing my book, which you'll see behind me, um, you, Wales is still the only country in the world that has any legal mechanism to deliver on the sustainable development goals. Now, I still struggle to believe that. 193 countries signed up to those goals, but Wales is the only country with a legal mechanism to deliver on that. And I'm, so my fundamental proposition is, Wales may not be a UN member state, but and I'm not suggesting that all countries do it like Wales, because it has to be about your own culture, your own economy, your own society, your own environment, and making laws to protect and enhance that. But I do think that some lessons from Wales at the very least should be why, what if every country in the world uh, 
passed a law to make sure that future generations were factored into all their policies and laws. And it will just fundamentally change what people do. And I'll just finish on the point that at one point I was energy minister as part of my portfolio. And I was given a proposition by the then UK government to look for a geological deep uh, disposal of nuclear waste. And I remember thinking at the time when I was saying, you're not doing this in Wales, because I've got no problem with the concept of nuclear energy, but I do have the problem with the concept of nuclear energy if the waste is just being passed on to future generations. So the benefit for one generation and pass on the problem to the next. And we've always done that. And I noted yesterday, somewhat wryly, the government is still looking for someone to provide a deep geological disposal site for nuclear waste. And this is over a decade on. No government should be looking to give problems to future generations. When we know the problems that are facing us, all governments should be looking at dealing with those problems now and making sure that they create more opportunity for future generations, because we've already created enough problems for them and for all those of you on this call. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. It's extremely inspiring to hear you speak. Um, and, to, and so much came up in, in, in your words just then that I'd really love us to return to later in the conversation, in the discussion, particularly the role about community, um, the role of community. And also I feel this relationship between the local um, and the grassroots and the governmental and the, at, le at the legislative level. Um, I find it fascinating that Wales is the only country in the world for the legal mechanism to deliver on the SDGs, um, sustainable development goals, and the role of, of, of politics within kind of a greater sense of systemic change um, and how that relates to us as individuals and our imagination. So thank you so much. Um, this question around um, language that came up um, when you were talking, it was, it was kind of the defining of what prosperity was for people and planet, I thought was, was, was really key. Um, and this idea that you had to talk about resilience and kind of get to a common agreement on, on what the whales would look like that was supporting of health of people and planet. Um, and it made me um, want to um, bring in Gillian now um, to think a little bit about the role of narrative and language. Um, because as a BBC presenter, I can imagine Gillian, you'd often find yourself um, in, in positions where you have a very large and mixed audience. Um, and the language that you use is so important to create a sense of kind of common vision and also a sense of a larger us. Um, so I'd love us, I'd love you to talk a little bit about, um, about language, particularly when it comes to ecology and the environment. Whew. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Ruby. Sorry, I, um, I can't continue with what I was planning to say without just acknowledging um what i've heard jane and rob say in turn um i mean i'm in, i'm in just an amazing company so um i you know what jane said um i i scribbled it down so quickly it was so simple but what if every country in the world passed a law that looked after future generations um i i genuinely just felt overcome with emotion Jane, when you said that, because I think to hear those words spoken so cleanly, um, with, with deep conviction, you know, uncompromising, but also with the weight of the lived experience of having passed that legislation and to know that it, it has happened, albeit in one country in the whole world, um, to me is just very, very massive. It's profound. Um, and similarly, Rob, um god there's so much I, I don't even know where to start but i think maybe i'll just land on because this might set me up for what i was trying to say or what i was hoping to say was the this beautiful story that rob set us all up with which was standing on top of the mountain and looking 
with down over the valley, but feeling this, this approaching storm and our guide saying, we got to get down this mountain. And um, what was lovely about that is, you know, I believe that, that that valley is there. You know, I believe that, you know, there is um, good things down in that valley. You know, th this isn't sort of, um, it, it really, there, that hope is there. Um, but one of the things that I've been really working with, and this will feed into Ruby, what you're asking me about language and um, moving away from a them and us narrative is one of, one of the things that I'm definitely trying to move away from is the idea that the guides, and by that I think what Rob may have been alluding to is I guess a lot of the science, the policy making, and you know, in terms of youth, children, I'm a mother of two teenagers, um, the parents, the adults in the world, the, I think quite often we present our stories and our narrative in this, how are we gonna get everyone off the mountain as if we really do have the answers. And the more I look into alternative language and narrative around ecology and how we understand how the world works, the more I'm convinced that we, the guides, and I don't even assume myself to be one, but anyway, the guides are also lost. That um, in a sense, there's, a, there's, a, there's some humility I feel that's missing or could be brought into this narrative of, of finding our way off the mountain together. Because um, I feel like there is, um, the true knowledge keepers are probably not the people who are being heard very much. And by that, I, I mean, especially indigenous and traditional knowledge keepers. Um, so to me, that that's sort of something I like to try and feed into uh, the language that I use um, in my presenting. And it's a struggle because, you know, what we, the way I feel is I have inherited um, a knowledge system that has been shaped by my education, by the culture that I was raised in, uh, which is actually predominantly Western culture. So the way I see the world is shaped very much by um, modern scientific thought. And I, you know, I subscribe to that. There's not a question, but it's the realization that there are many other ways of um, understanding the world or, or interpreting the world around us um, that can be equally as effective in terms of understanding natural cycles, seasonality, synchronicity in nature, ecology, how everything is connected, how the fruiting of one tree will draw the bears, which will draw the salmon, which will mark the changing of a season and understanding that level of um, detail in your environment, I find absolutely fascinating. And to me, there's a that level of literacy is absent in the language that I've been I've learned to speak in. Um, you know, and this is beyond just speaking in, in English, you know, it's speaking the language of science. So this is sort of the journey that I'm on in terms of um, you know, it, it, that encompasses what we're talking about here is is the what if, the, you know, the future that we're trying to imagine, the future that um, I hope collectively, you know, people would like a future where future generations, um, their well-being is guaranteed. And where a future where we can be proud to be ancestors of, of that future. I think that's um, and a really the idea that, yeah, you know, that future generations will look back and, and think, yeah, they did good. You know, they got us off the mountain. That would be amazing. So um, anyway, that's that's a whole kind of unwrapping of all the amazing thoughts and feelings that were kind of stirred up in me as I was listening to Rob and Jane. So just a little bit about me now. <laughs> um, so I was born in Kenya, but I'm I'm very, very mixed in terms of my heritage. And I'm very grateful for Kamala Harris for coming along finally, you know, and making my narrative a bit easier to um, to talk about. In that I'm I'm mixed Asian African um, heritage, born in Kenya, second generation Kenyan, um, and you know within that there's also Creole, there's other things. So in terms of um, language and how we talk. Or how I talk and relate to the natural world and relate to science and ecology. Um, I think identity plays a very big part in the way that I relate to 
the information and how I relate to nature. And I think because I have such a mixed, narr um, mixed heritage, I almost reach, overreach to find common ground in wherever I look. I'm, I'm, I think because I don't know where to put a flag in the sand and say, this is where I came from. Um, I mean, there literally isn't a single ancestral line that I can follow back and sort of go, oh, that's where I come from. I'm just someone who's very, very mixed. Creole. So as a result, I look for common ground and commonality. And some of the um, the ideas that I've come across recently, particularly that um, that make me think about language as something that can give us move us away from a them and us narrative as we look to the future um, is the idea that I, I like to use the word home rather than ecology so um, and I can go into this a much much more later but you know I play around with the idea that eco is um, really just means home the root word in, in ancient Greek is it means home so ecology economy ecosystems eco warriors all of it is just about our homes and to me that language of home is a very powerful one it stirs a, a deep longing in me um, it means a lot of things. It means it means something to everyone. Home is sometimes you know can be a safe place. Maybe it's not. Um, home is something that you, people may have. They may not. They may have left. They have fled from. They may face, find you know peace in their home. Um, so it means a lot of things to a lot of people. But I I like to try and root all the conversations that I have around environment, about sustainability, around ecosystems, habitats, biodiversity loss, pollution, to root it back to the idea that this is our home that we're talking about. So, um, like I said, I could talk a lot more about that later on, but I think I will, I will leave it there for now. I don't know if I've answered any questions. I was more of a download and uh, just a kind of a reaction to what I heard and just really, yeah, just so moving to hear Jane and Rob speak. So hopefully, you know, I can, I can talk more about home and my ideas around that as we go on in the evening. Thank you so much, Gillian, for that download. Um, it's, it's so empowering to reframe um, these words to see the environment and, and climate change discourse suddenly becoming so much more tangible and just seeing it as our home and how we relate to the home and the health of our home. Um, it becomes much, and it becomes part of us as well. It's rather than something far away. Um, and, and, and then it also becomes so much more important to protect it. Um, and when we see the terrible things that are happening to the world around us, we see it, if we start to see those things as us as well, um, then we wouldn't allow the things we see to happen. Um, so, so thank you so much. I wonder if um, Rob and Jane and Gillian, if you'd like to respond to anything um, that you heard each other say. Um, um, can I pick up on that home point because it's it, it's amazing how you can have these epiphanies um and uh, one of the um uh, yeah major epiphanies that for, for me came from uh, satish kumar um and i i kind of i knew intellectually that uh eco or oikos from the ancient greek as Gillian was saying was the core of ecology and of course, of course, then it's the core of economy. <laughs> but it was Satish Kumar who said to me in one of his fireside chats at Schumacher, well, he said to us all, didn't just say it to me, he said it to the room, but I felt as though it was an arrow that, you know, kind of pierced my soul when he said it, um, was he pointed out that, you know, if ecology is the knowledge of the planet home and economy is the management of the planet home, how can we manage what we do not know. So how come that everywhere in the world and particularly at the smartest universities, there are economy courses, but not ecology ones? And it was just one of those sort of moments where you think, absolutely, 
how are we ever going to get more people onto this agenda of thinking that the planet and the earth is important if we frame the whole discussion through the wrong lens so framing it through economy always makes you think that you can manage something about which you do not know and so the economy courses try and teach you how to manage something that not only do you not know the core but you do not know whether you're taking the right action so one it's for, there is a point about reframing that uh, I think is really important in this discussion about language and how we present this to people. Yeah, I would add, I, I've, I loved uh, Gillian's sort of uh, take on the mountain, on, on that mountain analogy. And there's different, I, I, I always imagined that the, that, so for me that began with when we started the transition movement, the idea was uh, how do we get the global north down the mountain? You know, it's not saying that everybody has to do this, but how, how do we create a culture where 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 it doesn't feel like moving away from something irreplaceable, but it feels like moving towards home, actually, to come back to home? You know, how do we cultivate in 2021 uh, a cultural sense of homesickness for a, for, for a low carbon, more ecological, more connected future? One of the ways that I, uh, in, in, I think in the transition handbook, I did a thing where I had this drawing of the mountain, uh, but then I also would flip the mountain upside down and fill it in with a black pen and say, actually, you could look at the oil age as being like a big, deep, dark, fetid lagoon that we dived into 150 years ago, because someone told us at the bottom of this lake was some incredible precious treasure. And we've been down to the bottom and we've rooted around and we can't find it. And then actually where we're going is heading back up towards sunlight and fresh air. And we've kind of given up on that on that silly thing. And we're trying to get back up to there. And I like that idea. I suppose what, what, what we tried to imagine the transition movement is, as being that when you're on that mountain top and you realize the need to get down that transition is like someone who comes and puts their arms around your shoulder and says come on I'll, I'll help you down I know the way down. I can show you the way down or I know the next bit anyway you know and, and that together with the people we figure it out but actually that the people who 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 are able to kind of navigate our way down there um and uh, and just as well to pick up on something else that, that Gillian said it's one of the things that has always really I've always been very mindful of having been involved in the environmental movement since I was about 18 or something is is the degree to which you know and, and I'm sure you know Gillian's insights so of somebody has to stand up in front of the, the nation and talk about this stuff and does so so skillfully is is that kind of that awareness that is often really lacking about how the words people use and even the fonts people use uh, are, can just be such a massive turn off to other people and having that real mindfulness about how we frame things I always noticed when I would started giving talks about transition 400 years ago or whenever it was you know that actually when you when I would start with a bit at the beginning of showing loads of graphs about how dreadful everything is and how everything's going the wrong way people kind of lean back in their seats but when I would start to tell stories about people like them doing things and what happened and when it didn't work and who they met and then they met this person and then this happened and then because of that that happened people lean in they kind of they, they, they sort of they, they engage physically in what you're talking about and I think the power of story uh, I always think you know the imagination all the imagination is basically is going to the cupboards of our memory and rootling around in those cupboards and finding stuff and putting two things together in a new way and creating something unique that's kind of what imagination is and so what matters is that when we're thinking about designing the food and farming of the future the society of the future is that the, 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 the cupboards in our memory kitchen if you like are full of really great things and great ideas, which is why, you know, things like Jane's book and the stuff that Gillian does on TV and the stuff that Chelsea Green published and the stuff that Positive News put out and all of these stories of people doing stuff are so important because it means that when we open those cupboards, we have something to work with. And telling those stories now, I think, is one of the most powerful and important things we can be doing. Yeah, um, it's interesting because talking about the the home and ecology and economy when I was reading Jane's Jane's book <laughs> um, there is two paragraphs where she crunched down you know really beautifully all of that thinking and it, I had, literally I had to sort of laugh out loud because it's sort of I've been blogging about this 
um, in my blog called No Place Like Home and sort of playing with this word and all the different ways you can come at it. And I was like, you know, it's just, a, it, to me, it's, it's exciting when um, it, that feeling that there's a lot of people, it's almost like a sort of a rising tide arriving at the same place. Um, so that was really interesting, but just to expand a little bit on what Jane said as well, just now about the the sort of moment with Satish Kumar and un realizing that, well, how can you run an economy without understanding the ecology? And I think that's a really, really important point, one that we could maybe talk about a bit more, which is when I come across um, ideas around, say, natural capital, where there's, an, there's a sense that, well, we might be able to uh, parcel up as aspects and components of the natural world. Um, again, to me, this sort of like, it, it doesn't quite sit well with me as an ecologist or someone who um, has respect for the idea that everything is connected, profoundly connected, because even just within the science, it's very difficult to, um, separate habitats and even species when we know for example that um you know forests are connected by their root systems which are connected by fungal uh, networks mycelium and we know that um you know the human body has more bacterial dna than human dna and then to me that the barriers and boundaries start to break down again it might be this part of me that's always trying to find the commonality but I sort of start to feel like, well, how do we know when one species begins and another ends? How do we know when one one habitat begins and another ends? That nature doesn't have these clean um, boundaries necessarily. And so, you know, that that idea of well, if we're going to run the economy or try and run the ecology, ecology and natural systems like an economy, will that work? So again, I think it's really important to keep going back to the roots of these words and really appreciating what they mean. And I think, you know, the way Jane put it, which is, um, you know, economy is the way we run the world. Ecology is the way natural systems run the world, put, put very, very simply. Um, and yeah, you know, so I think, you know, that that's something that as, you know, even with recently with the, the UK government's um, publishing of the Dasgupta review, which is um, really an economist, a leading economist looking at how um, we may redesign the economy and economic, economic systems to do less harm to the environment. I think this is such a key point to, to keep in mind that um, we really, you know, to, to understand the ecology and the connectedness of everything is absolutely fundamental in being able to find our way off this mountain, um, which we can. <laughs> and, I, and I think the, the one of the critical points I think that um, you've raised there for me, Gillian, is that point about connection. You know, when you talk about um, all the trees being connected, connected or fungi being connected through the mycelium, etc. Because if we if we lose that notion of connection, we think we can parcel up bits, but actually we've if we destroy the connection, we lose the whole. And I think that that for me was the sort of one of the big messages if we look at things like the State of Nature report uh, and we see the massive number of extinctions and, and most, they've all happened kind of under our eyes, as it were, they've, ha they've, they've happened in our own places. Suddenly you turn around and realize that you haven't seen a curlew for five years. Um, and then you realise they're now threatened, whereas, in fact, when you were a child, they were everywhere. And it's it's sort of so we, these things happen and because we're not seeing the connections. We're not actually joining up the pieces to look at how we protect nature. I mean, one of the things that in the context of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, it was um, somebody's kind. I, I say it's, it was a bomb I left when I left politics and went into the university sector a, a decade ago. Um, somebody's kindly described, I say that I should describe it as a bee bomb because therefore it's, it's able to generate, you know, a thousand flowers, we hope. But the point about um, it, it, it being a bomb is it, it was, it's asking everybody to totally the, change the way they think and to recognise that connectedness, to recognise that we live within environmental limits and that we have, we, we, we have our, our own actions as humans um, have meant that we are destroying those very environmental limits that are meant to protect us. 
And it really strikes me on that, on that point about connection, that if we don't reconnect, then actually we won't win the debate either. And partly there's a sort of, I have, I have some sympathy with the idea that if, if for those people who only think in monetary terms, you can ascribe a value to nature, maybe that will help those people understand it. But my heart says that actually what we have to do is enable people to fall back in love with nature again. And therefore I'm really sad that in the, con the only thing I, 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 I don't like about the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act is I wish that they had not named a resilience goal and they'd called it a nature goal because it would have made it so much more accessible in terms of people understanding what had to be protected and why. So that notion that you are so strong on about language is absolutely critical. Um, thank you so much, Jane. I love that you talk, spoke about falling back in love with nature. Sharon Blackie has written the most beautiful book on this topic called Reenchantment. Um, and similarly with um, what we've just been talking about, she speaks about how we have to reenchant how we see the world. And it, and it brings up these um, conversations around science and language. Um, and the idea that a lot of language can separate us from, from what it is that we're talking about and how can we recreate that sense of connection um, and, and reignite curiosity and, and wonder. Um, and, and I also just wanted to go back to Gillian, what you were talking about, the interconnections and the constant state of change that um, the ecology is always about, whether it's adapting and, and um, constantly um, changing and cycling all the natural systems. Um, and it may be about how that is the defining feature of the natural living world, is this state of constant and continuous change. And how funny and ironic it is that when we often think about our economic system, it's seen as a set with a sense of permanence um, and an unchangingness. And it's only when we come to take these things that Rob has this phrase, in particular, this what if, that we reignite the sense that everything can change and everything is always going to change. So it's been made by humans and humans can change it too. Um, and, and I would love, based on that idea about the what if, if we could maybe play the game, Rob, that you play in your podcast um, from what is to what if. I can't, I don't know if you want to introduce it, but I believe we have to um, imagine that we're in 2030 and yeah, everything's way... happened. Yeah, the way that I normally frame it is that I is I I ask whoever the guest is to close their eyes. The two guests, there's always two guests, so I ask them to close their eyes and imagine that I'm just turning on my time machine, which you can't quite, it's just over here, you can't quite see it, but I built it during lockdown with some plans I found online and some things I had lying around in my garage. And I'm going to turn it on and we're going to travel forward to a 2030, which is not utopia, but it's the result of the, in the nine years between now and then being the result of us doing everything we possibly could do. Uh, and then they emerge into that world. And then through the lens of whatever the what if question we're asking, they then take us on a walk around and explain to us what does it sound like and smell like and feel like. It's an exercise when I do talks that I do. I've done it with 1500 people in a hall in Belgium. I've done it on all kinds of different scales. And it's often something really moving for people, often because when people are activists, they're working on something. They don't often take the time to stop and think, yeah, what would it be like if we actually won? What would it be like if this stuff we're doing actually came to fruition? And what would that world be like to walk around in? And, and it's, it's something which, uh, which, which I find endlessly powerful and, and, and a really powerful thing to do. Like I said, it's, um, yeah, the future must enter into you a long time before it happens. And it's a really great exercise for doing that. Great, thank you. So, so maybe we can do it in relationship to the series title, which is um, Food, Farming and Healing Our World. So the question would be, what would the world be like in 2030 in relation to food, farming and planning? And I don't know who would like to answer that first. Jane, would you? Okay, whoops. <laughs> so excited at the idea. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's fair to say that when I did a podcast with Rob um, and uh, he asked me this question, um, I didn't have any forward notice of it. So <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was like, wow. And then I remember just looking out of my window and thinking, well, what would I like to see? You know, I described it earlier as a sort of desert in which my organic kind of forest garden um, uh, flourishes. And, uh, and I was thinking, what would I like to see that was different? And then I'm, so there's two assumptions I'm, I'm making here at the beginning. The first is that 2021 is the year of action. We've learned things through COVID about how we can do things speedily when they need to be done. And the UK hosting COP will make a difference. Um, it has to make a difference. So in this assumption, it will make a difference. And therefore there will be both legislative and policy support for changes. But there've been a couple of um, calls in the question for um, you know, basically what the act might look like in practice. So I'm gonna frame it in the context of, you know, what does farming, farming look like? Well, it's going to be agroecological. It is going to make sure that it does no harm and that actually it is regenerative in the context of nature. And it will not be that beef and cattle, sorry, uh, beef, cattle, um, sheep, lamb farming that we historically have had in Wales. Uh, well, only since Europe, oddly enough, because that's what took away the sort of traditional mixed farming. But it will be the kind of farming um, that ensures that actually there is a relationship that connection between the hedgerows, between the woodlands. Yes, of course, there'll be planting of trees, but actually grass sequesters a massive amount of carbon. And it will be farming designed to ensure that the current 3% of fruit and vegetables are grown in Wales. There will be sufficient fruit and vegetables grown in Wales. Currently we export um, beef and we export lamb. We don't export vegetables because we have to import all those things that are necessary to human life. So there will be sufficiency on our doorstep. And that takes me to my second element, which is about localism and what I'd call a foundational economy, where you actually focus on that local area in the context of communities, the local pound, the encouragement of local related activities. And in Wales, we have something called One Planet Developments, where often those One Planet Developments, one practitioner, who's actively living low carbon life and delivering at least half their income off the land, will do one set of activities and their neighbor will do another. So that kind of collabor collaborative collective future will be in place and they'll, and all as it were farming um, and uh, uh, gardening and other traditions will be that low carbon sequestration, so low carbon and sequestration. I do want to see what Rob was mentioning at the beginning. We should have a universal basic income. So for me, government should always be looking after the most vulnerable. It's why I entered politics. It's why I've promoted social justice, environmental justice um, uh, and economic justice through the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and the change of culture to deliver that. So a universal basic income is the basis on which we can reframe society. We can create safer communities, we can make them more cohesive, we can protect uh, language. And that like, leads to me also to a four day week, because the four day week is about making sure that we have sufficient time in the context of family. We know leaving Europe where there were protections in the 48 hour week that the current government wants to get rid of that. So we actually need to move absolutely in the other direction. I want to see individual carbon budgets. I was actually discussing these uh, with David Miliband um, back in, the, in 2008 in the context of the Climate Change Act. And I still think individual carbon budgets are important and that they should not be tradable. Like Rob, I don't fly or very rarely fly. Um, and I think that if people understand the consequences of their behavior, that, that that is one form of budgeting that needs to become central to people's life. And as part of that energy, we need to just totally flip this. We shouldn't be talking about energy in terms of how much more energy do we need to create, but how do we create the demand reduction and how do we reward that? I mean, I'm trying personally, and we probably will manage to do it in the next couple of years, to effectively be able to be off grid while being on grid. 
because of the way we manage our energy and because of the fact we create it ourselves uh, through solar power as well. So we want to look at demand reduction. And just as the same way that Wales is now the best recycler in the UK, as a result of recycling um, becoming core to delivery of an, a zero waste agenda, that zero waste agenda means that we don't put into landfill, we make sure we use it elsewhere. So everything should be turned on its head and that's what the act enables to happen longer term. So we're always thinking upstream. Don't think about extra landfill, don't think about extra energy, look at demand reduction and what can be in place for demand reduction. And all those things I'm talking about, it's all in place now. And when we think about how people go to cities where they can within five minutes go to a range of individual sellers, of bakers, the butchers, the grocers and everything else, people want that. And if it's walking and cycling that can drive that, if people can think about communities where they can engage in that and support local production, that creates that foundational economy. Um, and in that way, we can actually ensure that in 2030, not only will we have delivered on our climate um, targets, but we'll also have made, in my case, Wales, a much, much better place to live. And that has to be what it's all about with that respect for nature that we've been talking about all the way through. Thank you so much, Jane. That was extremely inspiring. Um, I would like to wake up tomorrow in that Wales. Um, <laughs> so, so shall we um, hear from Gillian? So I just unmute myself there. <laughs> Um, so I am going to play the game, <laughs> definitely, but I need to sort of maybe set the scene a little bit. Um, so before 2020, I was getting extremely busy in my life in that I was doing a lot more traveling around the country, doing public speaking, doing, um, you know, filming for the BBC Springwatch, um, series that I work on. And it was exciting. It was very energizing to feel like I was part of a movement that was looking to the future and trying to meet some big challenges. And then, of course, like for everybody, um, 2020 happened. And all of a sudden, all of that work got focused into the confines of my very small home with my two teenage children. And it really, man, it brought into sharp focus some big in inconsistencies in my life. And one of the things that I really noticed is I would spend my day um, in what I describe as high altitude thinking around, you know, the, the big challenges, um, environmental challenges and social societal challenges that we face. And then I would crash land into my actual life in my home with my children and realize I hadn't cooked dinner and now I needed to do some shortcuts. Is it a takeaway? Oh, I can't, you know, and that's where all the compromises were happened for me in terms of my personal responsibility in being the responsible citizen, consumer, human that I'd like to be. And I just thought, dang, this is okay. If I'm finding this hard, what about people who have more, challenges in their day-to-day -day lives where sort of you know the challenges are minute to minute not day to day not like did i cook dinner um so that is kind of where i started to think about how could in the context of rob's game how could we meet some of these they're almost imperceptible micro decisions that that i make that we all make in our home so this is beyond you know, am I going to separate my recycling? Am I going to, you know, get a takeaway or will I try and cook seasonally at home today? Um, and what I realized is, you know, again, with the context of home that, you know, home is the planet, home is the home, the, the, the roof over our heads, but home is also our hearts. And I started to think about, well, in this imagined future in 2030, so I wrote some notes because I did my homework. <laughs> Um, I started thinking like, where would I want to really start if I was really thinking about the home in my heart first? 
Um, and I felt that, you know, it's acknowledging this collective grief that I think we are experiencing. And it's, you know, as, as humanity contends with the changes that COVID and the pandemic has, has um, disrupted lives, disrupted systems and disrupted imagined futures as well. So I felt one of the first things I would like to see in my 2030 world is that on every level, from leadership levels to community to schools to in our homes, in our hearts, that we will have acknowledged and had the support to work through what things we've needed to let go in order to move through this disruptive event in all of humanity. So that would be the first thing I would I, I, I thought of. It's maybe not the th first thing to happen, but I just felt like that would need to be. If we don't deal with that grief. I don't know how it will keep showing up in our future. Um, other things, so I'll go more, bit more quickly through everything else. Um, I, in 2030, we have moved away from GDP, gross domestic product, as the indicator of, of how successful a government is running a country. Um, and we've adopted something along the lines of what New Zealand is currently doing, the happiness index. I believe Bhutan does that as well, the kingdom of Bhutan. Um, or something called the Human Development Index as well. This is stuff I'm learning about. I didn't, I didn't know that there are other ways to measure success for a government, and we could just make a choice to change. Um, that, again, along the lines of let's fix our homes, our hearts, so that we can do the bigger work. Um, more support for domestic abuse and violence and addiction recovery support. Because I believe that once we start dealing with these things that create the dysfunctional behavior, then we can start doing things like recognizing how valuable care is, um, caring for our families, caring for our communities, caring for our land, caring for our country and for future generations. Um, and then practically that the nutrient content of food would be returning to its pre-1950 levels. It tells me my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully you can still hear me. Um, that, that basically that would be for me the indicator that our farming systems are healing, that our food is actually more nutritious because our food at the moment is not very nutritious, even organic food, um, compared to what it was pre-1950, pre the intensification of farming. Um, that countries would be producing more locally, would be paying attention to bioregionalism, so eating more seasonally, eating more locally, all that stuff, and, and water and transport, all those things. Um, and ultimately, with, with all of this, the healing of the, the heart, the soul, the spirit, the land, the food, that collectively, we would start to be feeling the benefits of that. So by 2030, People are sleeping better, we're feeling more energized, feeling more hopeful. And um, there's still work to do, but we can actually put ourselves in that position to make the changes. So that would be my 2030. We're kind of on the way. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my, my turn, I guess. So uh, I'm, I'm enjoying some of the visions that people are sharing in the chat. It's worth having a look if you're not looking at that. So mine is gonna be a mixture of some of my own thinking and some of the things that, that some guests have shared in the podcast uh, when I asked them this question. So I think in terms of rural areas, we'll be looking at a landscape that looks much more like a patchwork rather than just vast vistas of green. We'll be looking at something that's much more like a patchwork quilt of agroforestry and different land use, uh, a countryside that is buzzing, bits of it are rewilded, there'll be a lot more people living in it, and there'll be a lot more people working in it, and a real diversity of, of, of work opportunities, uh, and people living in, in homes that they've built, mostly from materials from around the place, as we've started to see with the One Planet planning uh, thing in Wales, which is really interesting. Our cities are much less tidy, they've kind of gone wild, hard surfaces have been taken up, the dawn chorus is so much louder, and certain parts of the city 
are now renowned for particular kinds of bird song. And a nightingale last year did actually sing in Berkeley Square for the first time in a very long time. Uh, people are healthier, life is more purposeful. There's much more uh, cultural richness and diversity, which is really embraced. And food is at the heart, a central part of school life. Uh, all schools uh, are supplied with uh, all organic food from urban farms that were set up to supply them as part of a citywide holistic mental health strategy and physical health strategy. Everybody has access to good food uh, as a human right. Doctors' surgeries have been reimagined and are now surrounded by food gardens. Uh, there's much, much less traffic and a lot of roads have been taken back, turned into places for play, for forest for food being grown. Access to nature is recognized as a human right and the kind of uh, nature access apartheid that we see in this country at the moment where many people feel unable to go into rural areas uh, has really disappeared. Um, we see uh, uh, hospitals as sustainability centers uh, with, with lots of gardens and trees and we see things like um, like insulating people's homes, not just as an energy strategy, but as a mental health strategy. We see it as a uh, as a as a well-being strategy for the whole country. We no longer teach colon colonialism in schools. We have such amazing public transport that you'd be fairly mad to actually want to have a car. And we see great wealth as being as undesirable as gross uh, overweightness was in 2021. Uh, we see people, whatever their color, gender, body shape. Uh, uh, free to walk, feeling un, uninhibited by society pressures around them. Schools much more holistic and actually functions much more like art schools uh, in terms of how they teach people how to think, not what to think. And they often use the surrounding city as a classroom. We see a lot of neighborhood assemblies uh, which inform pol uh, policy making in the city. Uh, and policy is now made based on the assumption that most people are essentially pretty decent, like Rutger Bregman talks about in his book, Humankind. And that has profoundly changed criminal justice and how prisons are imagined. Imagination is now seen as being a universal right. And the conditions are put in place for people to have the best conditions for imagination. It's now become much more fashionable to, to be wearing something that you've repaired yourself rather than something new. And when people meet up, they say, oh, wow, you're still wearing that thing. Oh, I love how you've repaired that bit. That's really, really cool. Um, uh, uh, much of the money that went into policing uh, for poorer communities has now gone into healthcare and well-being uh, and many big roads have been closed uh, going in and out of cities. Um, uh, we see a lot more people who have their money invested in community shares, community businesses, uh, local renewable energy projects like wind farms than being invested in the banks. One of the things that happened after COVID was that we realized that all those great swathes of our cities that in the early 80s we turned into business districts and kicked out all of the traders and all of the people who lived there and all of that diversity, that that was a really daft thing to do because everybody could do most things from home anyway and you didn't need great office quarters. So the, those areas have all been now reimagined as really vibrant mixes of affordable housing, food being grown, different kinds of enterprises. Um, petrol stations have now been taken over in such a way that their big tanks underground are used to capture rainwater uh, for the local communities. Everywhere has more of a kind of a carnival feel to it. The cities are greener, there's gardens growing at the bus stops, streets are filled with trees. We use the word re a lot more on the front of our sentences, reimagine, rebuild, uh, recycle, repair. Um, and all buildings that are built new are built using predominantly local materials uh, and uh, people are trained how to use them. A lot of businesses now, their CSR, their corporate social responsibility, they actually embed people in the communities around and take their, take their professional expertise to help communities do things. And, uh, and uh, uh, I, th I think it was, I can't remember if, if it was uh, Gillian or David talked, uh, or Jane talked about, um, uh, new measures instead of GDP. I think it was Gillian. You know, one of the ways that we actually measure well-being in our cities now in 2030 is by the number of children playing in the street is seen as being one of the key indicators and also the number of girls who are able to cycle home on their own on bicycles after dark because we realize that when we set things like that as being the indicators in order for that to rise a whole load of other things have to be put in place uh, and have to have shifted and changed in the culture and those would be the manifestations of that and above all I think it's really really um, 
uh, a place where anything feels possible for everybody. And uh, the, the systemic racism, the kind of colonization and, and, and inequality that was so much a feature of life in, in 2021 has been, has, has been pushed away and, uh, and it's now great. Thank you so much, Rob, um, Jane and Gillian. I loved how um, common certain themes were throughout all of the divisions, in particular joy was a really key one. Um, Rob, you spoke about carnival um, and, and Jane, you spoke about the four day week um, and, and having time for care. Um, and, and Gillian, you also spoke about putting care at the center of the economy and food being more nutritious. And just that sense of connection was really, really apparent in all of these different visions. Um, and if we have these big dreams, how do you see us as, as really getting there? Like, I feel like once you have the vision, you have a sense of direction and you know where you want to go, but then how can we start to put those, those steps into action? Um, I, I think it's particularly interesting to ask this question to the three of you because you, you all work in such different ways, whether it's from the level of kind of government and policy or the level of community organizing and the change at the local level leading to systemic, or Gillian, in your case, at the kind of the level of, of a very national, um, at the level of media um, and speaking to, to the whole country um, through television. So I, I wonder how you would go about putting those visions into action? Um, yeah, so I think I, I, there was a, a saying, and I'm not sure whether it was written or, or you know, originated from the speaker, whether this was actually um, an older saying, but there's um, a Ghanaian called Kene Umia Sigbu who um, works in sustainability um, he, he's, he, he's quiet in his work. Um, he does sort of write and publish in newspapers, but mostly works as a consultant. And we were chatting, this is just before Christmas actually, about um, strategies and, you know, the work that we do. It was kind of like a, you know, offline, off the record, just, you know, a chat. And he was talking about the different ways that change makers can move through the world. Um, they can be the, the, the visible change makers or they can be the quiet change makers that operate behind the scenes. And we were discussing well, which is more effective or whether it's a combination of it of, at all. And he said something that has just stayed with me ever since. He said that never get so far ahead of your army that you look like the enemy. Has anyone heard that? Has anyone else heard that? Okay, some have some. It was the first time I'd heard that. And um, and maybe if someone in the chat knows where that comes from, I'd be really interested because I've been trying to get to the get to it. Um, but it really stayed with me. And I guess what what I took that to mean is that in my work as a communicator and presenter, I pay attention to my audience. Um, and you know, I genuinely think that. Um, I, you know, if I don't care about my audience, there's no connection there. And, and then what I hope they will take away from whatever I'm saying is lost. So my, my starting point is caring about my audience and trying to then understand where, where my audience is so that I don't get so far ahead. I look like the enemy because if I'm genuine in my ambition and desire to see all of us um, move towards this beautiful future that we're all imagining right now, then I don't want to leave anyone behind. I don't want anyone to feel they're not part of that. So my language is, is I, you know, maybe sometimes I go too far in trying to be inclusive in my language. Um, but in terms of the communication, I guess the, the, the starting point for me is to try and work out well first of all is how far is my audience in the process of um i guess the scales falling off falling away sort of trying to you know that realization that there are a lot of systems that 
um, no longer service or probably didn't serve anyone or very few people, <laughs> um, let's face it. Um, you know, it's it's trying to work out where people are on that journey and therefore how I how I can take them with me in my storytelling. Um, maybe one of the, the nicest places I like to start with is very, very simple, um, which is the idea of trying to find our place again in natural systems. And language is such a big part of this. And I mean, lots of people have spoken about this. So this is not my original thinking by any stretch of the imagination. But the idea that, for example, a lot of indigenous cultures don't have the word for nature, for example. And I then notice how much I use the word nature in my work. And the idea that the second you say the word nature, you separated humans out of that system. So how do I change my language? so that it is just a given that we are part of the system, we are nature, we have um, a position in this impossibly complex um, three-dimensional matrix that has more connections than we probably will ever be able to mo model and imagine. Um, so it, it's trying to use like that basic idea of like, well, what other word can I use if I'm not talking about, you know, if I'm gonna talk about nature, and how do I embed us? So is it sort of using words like instead of species and habitats and ecosystems, is it wild spaces and the wild things and thinking of other species as our relatives? I mean, there's so many different ways to play with that. Um, and again, like I said, depending on my audience, I can play a lot or a little less with this idea of, well, what words can I chuck out? that aren't helping connect us back into the matrix of the living system that sustains us? And what words do I need to keep so that I keep my audience with me? So it's, it's, um, it's a work in progress, <laughs> basically. But it is, it is you know, a constant for me, um, appraising and reappraising of my language, noticing when I'm falling back into habits, um, it's unlearning, it's relearning and it's having that humility in my in my work to recognize that I have so much still to learn. Um, and hopefully as I learn, I can share. It tends to be first, second and third. Um, yeah, I think it's a really, really, really important question. Because obviously if all we do is sit around and imagine all the time, that's really no use to anybody and it has to be embodied in action and it's why you know we always describe the transition movement as being a movement of communities who are reimagining and rebuilding the world that balance of those two things is really important and uh, i was seeing in the chat mira was there's a conversation in in the chat about so uh, so uh, colonization and systemic racism and you know she, she said i wanted to hear more specifically how it goes away uh, and I'm not sure that, uh, so f for me, what I see actually in, um, is that actually the asking of a really great what if question and the opening up of the space to explore that um, is, is, is a really important part of all of that because it's, you know, we, we can't this evening sort of set out a plan of exactly how that's going to happen. But actually I take a huge amount of inspiration from, uh, from many of the, 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 the black political movements for whom what if is fundamental to what they do. Uh, there's a woman who I think is brilliant called Mariame Kaba, who is a, a big figure in the prison abolition movement in the US who writes a lot about this. And, and for me, that question, what if there were no prisons? I mean, what an incredible question to keep that question alive for 50, 60, 100 years in a culture for whom that is almost an unimaginable question, you know, to keep that question alive and to keep asking that question and to keep bringing the focus back to that question. Um, and, and what uh, Walida Imarisha said about all organizing is science fiction. I think actually when we when we do our work with those with those questions in mind, then we, we, we embark on a journey where we're doing things and we're learning as we go. We can't design the whole kind of thing before we go, but it's, it's the questions that we ask are really, really important. And I guess the things that I learn from the transition movement is that like the story I talked about in Liège, they framed that question in such a way that it was hugely invitational. 
And there were so many people around the city who were sitting there saying, oh, wouldn't it be great if such and such happened? Or, or they kind of have a dream or they kind of have, uh, they kind of have a, um, it, it, it creates a framework, like a basket into which they can bring their ideas and, and a narrative. And, and it really kind of grows and grows and expands uh, off the back of that question. Uh, and that's what I love is, is to see when, when, when people get a really, really good, uh, frame that what if question right and use that as the uh, to, to underpin their activism and, and where they take it. Um, yeah, and also just the other thing is, I, is, is that I would say, I feel one of the big, big things in all of this is, is the role of facilitation. I always love that song, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. I think we need a, a version now called The Revolution Will Be Well Facilitated in terms of the, the, the skill I see again and again in groups, the, the importance of good facilitation and what that makes. And, and, and you know, when, I, when I've been part of really big community consultation processes, I'm part of a project in my town where in a town of 9,000 people, we consulted five and a half thousand people over what should happen to this particular site in the town and you think well if you can sell that many people how on earth do you get anything consistent that emerges out of that process actually when it's really well facilitated and you can sort through it the really strong ideas kind of float to the top uh, of that conversation and, uh, and and so we really need to, to, to be producing a mass uh, wave of great facilitators who can run out and support this work uh, all over the place. I think um, one of the big elements of this for me is the is is the way that words become loaded, and it's it it actually gets in the way of there being a sort of rational response um, in terms of the action that needs to be taken. So, you know, in the privacy of of people's own rooms, um, people from all political parties. Um, uh, well, at least the ones who buy into the notion that there is science that's giving us evidence about what is happening uh, to, the, to, to the planet. But they may not be able to use particular terminology. And actually, one of the things that um, we're finding in the context of the discussions about the book, which I, once again, I was also not aware of until, uh, until I wrote the book, um, is that actually language around future generations is embracing. It's a big hug, a kutch, as we call it, it is in Wales. It's a big hug around people because everybody cares about their children and their children's children. Um, we do want it to go beyond the people who they actually know. We want to think of this in, I mean, let's try and think seven generations forward in the way that we should have learned from the indigenous communities in the, in the context of, seven generations. But I was minded while you were talking, Rob, about a conversation that I had with um, uh, a, uh, a master's student in Harvard. I was, I was teaching master's students around the philosophy um, of future generations. And he asked to get in touch with me afterwards. And he was a Republican. Well, I assume he still is a Republican. Um, but he told me that he wanted to, me to talk to a group of Republican young people because he couldn't get people who were climate activists because nobody would come and they wouldn't want that conversation. But actually reframing the conversation in the context of future generations actually was an opening in the context, and a political opening. And so there are, there, we do have to be aware of these issues around ideology and the way parties, political parties um, describe uh, and either will sign up or won't sign up to particular uh, visions of the world. And sometimes we can nuance so that actually it opens a, a, a frame for the discussion. And I'm not saying that um, having a Future Generations Act in every country in the world appropriate to language, culture, uh, identity, um, society, economy, environment is, uh, is, is going to be a complete panacea. But the question that was asked about, um, you know, how, how we deal with some of these big issues like um, the racism, or colonialism, uh, um, the, one of the things that also came over to me in these discussions this year is that actually if 
government of whatever political party is prepared to sign up to a values framework that says that it wants to create a different kind of society and as a result of its interventions will try and remedy now some of those inequalities so that in the well-being of future uh, generations act um, in the context for example of equality um, it's about a society that enables people to fulfill their potential no matter what their background or circumstances including their socio-economic background and circumstances well if that becomes a a program for delivery that actually requires that government to look at how to help and support communities which have been disenfranchised so that in a sense a well-being of future generations act that covers all those areas can on the one hand potentially deal with issues around covid and a pandemic can deal with issues around climate change which is explicitly referenced three times in the in the goals in the wales act and also tackle some of these issues around the inequalities experienced um, in communities and it's for I don't know where I mean I, I'm not suggesting that it's um, a, a necessary condition but it does provide an opportunity to think differently about the way in which um, to tackle some of those massive divisions uh, that are there in our society some of which have been instituted by the very governments that in a sense I, I, I became a politician to to, to fight against. So I just I think that at the moment it's incredibly important in terms of pulling as many people into these big debates as possible that actually framing a value framework um, becomes particularly important. And in Wales there'll be an acid test in May of this year because there's going to be a Welsh general election and uh, if another party gets into government it will also have to deliver on the obligations of a Future Generations Act. And therefore it's going to be really interesting to see if another party does get into government, what that means in the way that it will take uh, its agenda forward, but also the way in which the people of Wales can call out their public services and their government for not behaving in those ways. And that's really, I mean, if I can get a message out to anyone, it's, you know, this needs to become a people's act and people need to be able to call out uh, those people they elect for not performing uh, in, that, in, in, in that way. And there are mechanisms to do that. There is a future generations commissioner who's independent of government. There's an audit process independent of government and the courts. So there are ways in which by the nature of being legislation, this is much longer lasting than a policy. Legislation has the capacity to move from one election to another uh, unless it is repealed. And that gives a major opportunity to totally change culture and operation in any individual country. And I think fighting for that kind of approach helps all of us who believe in equality, who need and uh, recognize the importance of nature, not as humans as supreme to nature, but humans as part of nature. Let's go back to that first principle of that first Earth Summit in 1992, uh, where humans have the right to live in harmony with nature. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, in, um, in the chat, um, Mira wrote, what's missing that there's been um, people, black radical feminists have been reimagining futures for a long time. The vision is there, the right questions are being asked, people are being organized. But what's missing is how to get those in power to let go of power and seed space. And I feel that a lot of what you spoke about just now touched on, on this topic because you're talking about values framework and a program for um, delivery and ways to include voices in a debate that can overcome the institutionalization of divisions in society that have been in place. Um, 
And I know that these frameworks, you've been using them when it comes to making decisions and in the decision-making process as well. Um, but then if we're gonna go back to Mira's comment, how, are we go how would you go from, from there to actually getting those in power to seed the space? Or do you think that the frameworks are enough in and of themselves? Um, can I, I don't, I don't know is the answer to that. I mean, there are many, many people in, in, in Wales, particularly um, uh, people who've been involved in the environmental movement for years who don't think the Future Generations Act is strong enough to have, have those additional protections. But we also have very strong environmental legislation and for me, this was this was about being inspirational. It was about hope. I mean, I love the fact that Gillian's wearing this jumper that says hope. And every time I look at the screen, there she is saying hope. But for me, it is all about that. It's about the Future Generations Act needs to be something that inspires different thinking. It is the permission to think differently. Um, and But it also needs, uh, therefore, people to use it to call out their... Uh, representatives and in many cases people don't have those powers I mean there'll be people on this call who've written to their uh, elected representatives many times who've lobbied who've been in demonstrations and everything else but unless that elected representative has either specifically said they're going to do something and then fail to do it and then can be um, have their view changed by uh, democratic processes or unless that um, elected representative um, it already is minded to deliver something and needs public help to enable that delivery to operate, unless communities um, will fight for that basis uh, on which change can uh, happen. There, there's, we don't know yet whether having a strong values framework that is underpinned by a, a commissioner who can hold those public services to account, by a, an audit office that can hold those public services to account, um, and by people who will then feel confident in holding those public services to account. I mean, this is the first law of its kind in the world, and it's still very new. But what I would say is, if we don't actually start with at least doing this much, I'm afraid that some of those other elements, which is how that populism that is actually driving inequality uh, in so many countries across the world uh, will potentially be uh, an immensely negative impact and ensure that actually money goes upwards, nature is not on anybody's agenda, and that we have a, we have a divide and rule agenda. I mean, even after everything that we've seen, I saw figures yesterday that say that 72% um, of the Republican party um, uh, support Donald Trump. And when we're thinking about the sort of divisions and threats to democracy and everything else, we have to understand that these are real threats in countries. But actually, if people start thinking not about the impact on themselves and their pockets, which in the UK often <laughs> decides how people vote in an election, but actually thinking about the future for their family, longer term, we hope that that will inspire them to make different times of types of decisions. And so far, that is not the way the political dialogue is framed. But it could be if we all go out there and fight for it. Just could I add one thing to what to what Jane was saying, which uh, I, I feel like. Um, uh, hang on, what was I going to say? It's completely gone, has it? No, it was again. Uh... No, hang on. I'll have a little think and then I'll come back. I'll hand over to Gillian. Sorry, it's been a very long day. <laughs> hang on, just unmuted myself now. <laughs> um, yeah, the, 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 it says hope and it's uh, Black Lives Matter as well. Sweatshirt, it's it's it was a fundraiser. Um, I'm going to sort of, sort of step out because quite often as I'm listening to debates, I start to fall back into a trap of being limited by what my mind thinks is possible. Um, 
and you know based on you know the realities of of the present time you know so i'm going to step out of that for a second um just to kind of address some of the things that are coming up about um, this, the intersectionality of what we're talking about here, about climate, about environment, about social justice, racial justice, um, and reckonings. And I, I would say two things to that. One is is maybe a bit more practical. That if you know, if you're just being pragmatic, I I believe that the the movement which began hundreds of years ago, which is continuing um, in terms of seeking racial equality for people of color, um, is sadly, but also amazingly, um, one which is intergenerational resilience. The, to continue this work across centuries and to know that we're still not there takes an enormous amount of um, cultural resilience and, and also to um, recognize the, how multidimensional it is. So looking at racial equality in America is, is, is different. There are many things that will be the same, but it's different across the whole Black and African diaspora. So if there was one thing I was going to say is that activism has a lot to learn from the resilience and the strength of spirit. There's a lot of, um, I, I often think about, for example, music, um, like gospel music, for example, where each song will take you from absolute despair. I mean, this is, this is music that was born out of some of the most in, in, like unimaginable human suffering. And each song will take you from despair to grief, to hope, to euphoria. And that cycle, that emotional cycle is, is I think the key to the resilience of the movement and the fact that it, you know, it, people won't stop until that equality is achieved. And so for me that, you know, if you were looking at other activism, at the very least, looking at how long this has been going on for, there's something to learn there. So that's one thing to say. But the other thing that I, I think about a lot, because if it, frankly, most of my audience um, is white um, on BBC Springwatch, you know, most of my followers on my social media are. So I think a lot about, well, how do I relate this back to my audience? Going back to Kene, Kene's quote, you know. And I, I think one of the things that's said a lot, but worth remembering is that we all have indigenous roots. And one of the most fascinating stories that I'm still sort of researching and picking my way through as someone who only arrived in Britain as an adult is the disconnection from British indigenous culture and when that happened and the trauma that was around that, the, you know, the, the genocide really, when, when Britain was invaded 2000 years ago. And there's many people, scholars, people who've studied a lot more about this than I have, who put forward the idea that that is potentially the kind of the, the original trauma that has then been manufactured and exported around the world. It's a theory. It's one that I find fascinating and interesting. And one that I think is potentially, again, that way of finding that common ground. Um, because there's no question in my mind that, um, you know, if, if, if it was up to me, it wouldn't be about making space around the table. We need a whole new table um, when it comes to being more inclusive in, in culturally. So, um, you know, at, at present time, look, you know, looking with the at what we have available to us. I, um, I still find it quite interesting that we're still looking to and putting faith in systems that kind of led us to this, where we are at this point in humanity. Um, and, you know, if we had that ability and luxury to look back, and really connect every single person to their indigenous roots, um, including, you know, here in Europe, then you know what it's just going back to that you know would we reconnect ourselves to the the knowledge systems that will help us to find a different system 
that allows us to live as part of this living system, not apart from it. So those are the two things I, I had to say about that. Well, thank you, Julian. I don't think I can follow that really. Um, just a couple of a couple of thoughts, I guess. We're, we're talking about trauma, and on the podcast that I do, from what if to what next, with the last one we did was what if we address the trauma that lies beneath the world's problems, and it was absolutely fascinating. The two women who were guests on it were just extraordinary, and they they were talking about that same thing that kind of trauma from 2000 years ago and how it would pass down and pass down and then exported to the US and then exported all, all over the place. And uh, one of the things that one of the one of the, the guests on that said that I thought was fascinating was she said all trauma is collective, which was one of those things where I had to sort of go off and sit and digest for for quite a while afterwards. All trauma is collective. And 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 just the the the, the thought that came to mind when we were to when 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 I think when Jane was talking was one of the one of the reasons why I think imagination and storytelling is so important in, in all of this is that we no longer have I have a dream politicians. You know, we had Martin Luther King, we had Rob, Bobby Kennedy, we had politicians who could who could look to the space in front of us that's the future and they could fill it with stories and dreams and people could go, yeah that i'll have that please and we don't do that anymore we have very very few people who do that and instead what happens when that space is left unoccupied is it gets filled with people who want to make the future what the past was and who who say we need to go back we need to make america great again like great for who when when was it great who was it great for when how exactly what are you talking about you know or take back control all this sort of back we have a politics of back because that 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 future space in front of us is not being populated with, with with possibilities and dreams and stories and somebody mentioned in chat the um the years of repair video that was created by the leap project Naomi klein and alexandra ocasio cortez and people which if people haven't seen it is a beautiful kind of animated telling of the story of the next 10 years which doesn't shy away from from how big the the, the challenges of, of of dismantling structural racism are but it also accompanies that with the repair and the rebuilding that's going on during that time and runs those two stories kind of in parallel with each other and I went to an amazing place in France a, a few years ago uh, called Grand Saint which is a, well, it's a pretty grim place actually it's like it's like near Dunkirk and it's a pretty kind of impoverished city that's been used as a long time for a kind of as a sort of immigration dumping ground by the government and huge amount of the population below the poverty line. They had an amazing mayor there called Damien Karem, whose response to the climate emergency was to say, everything we do to tackle climate change has to be working in the needs of the poorer people in this city. So all the public transport is free, all the social housing is passive house, all the all the around all the poorest housing blocks they took up all the tarmac and concrete and created gardens and uh, and more and when they installed low energy street lighting in the city and saved about half a million euros a year rather than just pocketing that saving they distributed it as an income boost to the poorest people in the city so i feel like you know there are places where we can really look and say and and see what we can start to populate that future with and we need to become much much better uh, and I have a dream and filling that future space because if we don't do it other people get in there and fill it with all sorts of toxic stuff that really as we're seeing around the world is doing us absolutely no favours at all. Thank you so much um, everyone and especially Gillian, um I loved how you brought up other social movements um, and the intergenerational resilience and the cultural resilience um, that has been present in so many of these and how it can be so inspiring to look to, look to them um, and the cycles of emotions that go from hope to grief. And, and thank you for bringing grief into the conversation um, twice because it's something that I think we don't often think about especially in a culture that kind of denies grief almost. We, we, we don't give it space in the way that we should. Um, and death in particular is the, probably the most obvious place where, where, where we don't really have the space for grief. Um, and I was just, we've, we've got just 10 minutes before we finish. Um, 
And I was thinking it might be quite nice to hear from each of you how you keep the dream alive, um, particularly when it comes to resilience. It's like when things are going so badly and it feels like that mountain that we've been going and not give up. Um, Jane, would you like to share first? Um, thank you. I mean, I, I think one of the um, definition differences between uh, kind of optimists and pessimists um, is actually in relation to whether you believe people are inherently good <laughs> or whether you believe people are inherently bad. And I, 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 you know, I believe people are inherently good, and um, and I think that therefore I always feel that even if you know, a bad one comes along <laughs> and tries to stop what I'm doing, that a good one will follow, and actually many more good ones will follow. So I think there's something about um, uh, having needing. I mean, we all need to feel optimistic because we have to feel that there is a really important. Uh, future that can be won and if we can be an agent of that in any way and so for me I suppose it's about at one level it's a personal level that uh, you know my family we we took a decision back in 2007 when I was given the environment responsibility as a minister that we were going to do one big green thing every year um, and that's actually been a joyous journey because each time we've done something whether or not it's about you know, doing something to our house or our building or transport or, or, or behaviour or how we grow our food or any of those things. We've met so many other wonderful people on the way that actually it, it really has been a, a very joyous journey. But I'm also minded of, a, of um, a conversation I had with a very successful entrepreneur who was speaking to a group of business, business students in the university and he put up this slide on the screen and, um, and it was a, a picture of a river and in the river there were loads of sharks. Um, I don't know why there were sharks in a river in this particular thing, but I suppose we all recognize the fin. And he put these pictures of sharks up and says, okay, how are you gonna get from this side of the river to the other side of the river? And people were trying to sort of think about, um, uh, you know, how they were going to negotiate the sharks and things and I just thought, I just don't recognize the sharks, <laughs> which was actually the answer. It's if you see everything as the barrier that's gonna stop you doing something, then actually, and this goes back to Rob's point at the beginning, it limits your imagination. The, it always, the, the imagination is saying, I don't see the barrier. Or if there is a barrier and it's a real barrier, how can I get around this barrier? So it's always got to be in some way really positive um, thinking and that is the thing that sustains me and there are dark nights and there've been very dark nights during the, the sort of covid lockdown uh etc and 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 i'm very privileged i i know in being safe and in a rural environment and space and work to do on the land and all those things but i do think that, that we have to find whatever the passion we have that drives what we want to do and that way we will always have a driver and that driver is what keeps me going. Shall I go next? That'd be great for Gillian to have the last word. Would that be all right, Gillian? What do you think? <laughs> or do you want to go next? I don't mind. What do you want to do? You know what? I, <laughs> I don't mind. Um, if, no, you, I, I'll, I'll, I don't really want to have the last words. Oh, go on then. Well, you you, you go next. Because <laughs> I'm not sure it's that profound, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I. To be honest, yeah, I, I, it isn't profound. I sing. Um, that is that is how I I keep going. I, I like singing and music. Um, so I find that if I stay in the space of thinking about environmental and social change, that I just can't sustain it. So I have um, this other, well, it's not so secret now because I'm telling you all, this like still this kind of fantasy, a dream, like at 2030, this is where I'm going to be. I'm going to be headlining on Glastonbury because it will be running again. 
I'm not letting go of this dream. I, I always wanted to be a singer. Um, so I sing and I play, I play, I, I just make believe that I'm, you know, this amazing singer and I sing a lot. So that's one of the ways that I keep going, but um, I'm sharing that because I saw in the chat and I wish I could, I didn't see who wrote it, but I just caught it because I'm not good at watching the chat and talking and listening. Um, but I saw someone say in response to something I said, which is grief and joy reside in the same place. And the reason why that set me off about the singing is that um, with vo voice work and vocal work, that that's absolutely true, that you produce the, the sound in the same place. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot there that you could unpack about how this emo these two emotions live side by side, are produced in the same place. And as a singer, um, you, you, that's that's where you find that same kind of crying sound. Um, so I found that really fascinating, but I guess also, so I've just seen someone say, try busking, I will, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, the other thing that I, I sort of also think is that in some ways being an optimist and being hopeful is just a survival strategy because it just sucks when I feel down and pessimistic and I go there a lot. Um, but you know, I can't stay there long because it just, it's so awful. So it's partly just, I'll just pretend that everything is hopeful until I find evidence. And so usually there's, you know, a story of recovery or just an amazing little hopeful moment in the news or something. And I'll be, there it is. That was the evidence. It was worth hanging in there until I got some evidence. So I, I go from one to the other to the next. So games really. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I garden and I grow things and I go for walks and I do make lino cuts. I do lino cut printing is my been my lockdown discovery of of, of making things. Uh, I think I um, I feel like if you I feel like if you don't have times when you feel really heartbroken about the state of the world, then you're kind of not paying attention. And that if you are somebody who lives in the world, uh, what was Aldo Leopold, the ecologist, used to say something like, to be an ecologist is to live in a world of wounds or something. You know, it's like actually, uh, you know, so, 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 but uh, Paul Hawken always put it really beautifully when he said, if you read the science on climate change and you're not a pessimist, you haven't read it properly, go and read it again. But if you spend any time among the movements of people around the world who are trying to do something about it, and you're not an optimist, then you don't have a heart. And I kind of, I kind of feel like both of those two things, it's like, that's the AC and the DC, that fluctuating between the two things is kind of the energy that drives me forward. And, 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 and also, you know, when some people, so some people say, well, you know, we've lost or it's too late or something it's like it doesn't work like that this isn't something where all of a sudden like all of a sudden there's a moment and it's completely too late it's like every fraction of a degree that the world warms really really matters and uh and, and it's we have to do everything that we do i feel like uh the pessimism is a kind of a luxury that I don't have really and, and, and I need to really uh, do what I can and, and one of the things within the transition movement that I feel is really important is is really paying attention to burnout because I've lost so many good friends to burnout and we all of us many people on this call involved in various movements where we don't pay enough attention to burnout and to supporting our colleagues through this we've lost so many brilliant people who get burnt out with doing this work and one of the things in the transition movement here in Totnes we have a thing where we have a lot of people who are professional counsellors and therapists and stuff. Whose role in transition is to offer support free of charge to the people who are at the heart of moving transition forward. And I know there have been times for me, because I would never for a moment say doing the transition stuff that I've done for the last 12, 15 years or whatever has been really easy. There are times when it's been really tough and where you feel really, where you feel really vulnerable and isolated and uh, actually to have that kind of support has really made the most enormous difference. And I guess the other thing, last little thought I would leave you is that, that you know, I'm, I'm somebody who, who, who enjoys watching football and, and I've seen enough games. I watched a game, I remember, where, where the team that I support was losing 3-0 at half time and they came back in the second half and they won it 5-3. And I have no idea what was said in that change room at half time, but I know that it wasn't. Oh, well, it's probably a bit late now. Is I don't know why we're going to, let's not bother really. You know, we, we're stuffed. 
I think we should just go out there, you know, let's just go home. Do you know what I mean? So actually, no, you, 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 you put everything you can into it because there's always a possibility and there are enough stories of change happening really rapidly. And if you look up, if you're interested in look up the Rapid Transition Alliance, uh, have an amazing, have been brilliant at collecting stories of rapid transition throughout history. And if you need some reassurance that there are times when change can just happen really, really quickly, almost overnight, things that looked completely permanent and like they were always going to be there. And all of a sudden the next morning had gone and everyone was like, how did that even happen? You know, there are so many of those stories and those are stories that I take a great deal of uh, inspiration from. Thank you so much. Um... We're one minute to eight, so definitely, sadly, it's time to say goodnight and, and we finish. But I am, um, I for one, and I hope everyone um, on the call, I feel extremely inspired listening to all of you speak um, from different perspectives and about things in a slightly different way, but with the same message of what if, um, to, and, and like, well, it could be possible. and really helping us to to see that from with grief and with joy it's that that can drive us forwards and that's what makes being human and being alive at this time so so amazing and so terrifying as well but um but better if we think about it in the in the in the amazing um, so, so thank you to everyone for joining us and, and to the, the three of you in particular. Um, and thank you to Chelsea Green. Um, and this is the final session of the month um, and it's been an incredible journey. So I um, would like to thank all the participants. Um, and if you've got any questions, just write, you can write by email. And tomorrow um, we will send around a recording so you can watch it again. Um, and for those that weren't able to join us in person, they can watch it in their own time. And we'll also send around the chat and links to the speakers books. So thank you so much. <laughs>